Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray and I teach watercolor and today we are doing our dot flowers project. Ooh! Ah. <laughs> we have Michael here who's working the cameras. Oh, hello. Uh, Keenan's on vacation, he's taking a break which is so good for him and so we have Michael to fill in. He's filmed with us before. He's also my husband in real life. Lucky duck. So we get along. Um, we are going to be doing this project in four steps. So our very first step is we are going to do a light wash on our vase and our flowers. Our second step is we are going to start adding the dots on everywhere. <laughs> All of the places. All the um, and then step three, we're going to let that dry. And I made that its own step because we do have to let it dry for quite a bit. And then our very last step is we're going to take a damp brush and just smear the, all that color. Okay? That sounds great. Um, we are using three paint brushes for this project, around two, around six, and around 12. I do also want to say that for the dots, we will be flipping our paint brushes over and using our handles. So if you have, take a look at your paint brushes and take a look at the size handles and dots that you can make with that. And maybe you have a different brush that you would want, you think would work better, or just kind of look at the sizes of that because that's what we will also be using along with our bristles. We are using three colors in this project. So our very first color is Tahoe Blue. Our second color is Lemon Yellow. And our third color is Fuchsia. Now this is our in-house paint. It is a liquid um, dye-based watercolor, which means it is super, super vibrant, fun to mix with, fun to play with, a great tool to get you started into watercolor. I have cut my paper in half and I've taped the edges using my favorite tape, which is Holbein soft tape. And then I kind of just centered my outline over the paper. And how I do that is you can use, like if you have a light box, that's probably a little bit easier when you don't and you're using graphite paper, you can kind of see the paper edge through. And then what I like to do is I'll just peel up and do a visual check between the edge of my image and where the tape starts. Like it's probably a little bit on the left-hand side or move to the right too much, but I'm okay with that. Um, we're going to use our graphite paper to transfer the outline, then we will do our oath, and then we'll get to painting. Perfect. All right. So I've already taped my outline. I'm going to take my graphite paper. You're going to do dark, shiny side down. And then you're going to take a pencil and just go for it. Now, if you want to change anything about this, feel free to. As you can see, this was a rough sketch. Um, I wasn't really focused on trying to make this very realistic. I mean, look at these. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little wonky, um, but that's okay because the spirit of this project was inspired by a contemporary artist. Her name is Yayao Kusama. Um, she's Japanese and her work, and I'm gonna talk more about her work, but probably one of the most um, prolific things about her work is her use of polka dots. And so I really wanted us to embrace polka dots in this project. And um, so that's kind of what I focused on. So it's not necessarily about what it is that we're painting. Heck, we don't even have to have flowers here. We could just, you could just be doing polka dots all over a piece of paper and that would speak to her style and um, what we're trying to learn about her anyway. So give yourself for uh, freedom and permission to literally do whatever you want. As long as there's dots. Just have some dots, please. <laughs> um, but I will say that these flowers in this vase, even though I, she has, she's, um, has done a lot of work in various mediums and ways, um, these flowers and vase were inspired from some of her works that she has done on paper. But I would say, and what we're going to go through today is actually probably more of her like installation artwork. Um, so it's kind of like a mix of all of these elements of can, her work. Can you, for the newbies at home, explain what an installation piece is? An installation piece is like a three-dimensional space. So think of like your paper is your canvas, a room is a canvas. So then you would look at a space, whatever size that space is, and then you would create artwork. So then it's like 
a physical experience within that space and a three-dimensional artwork experience instead of just on a piece of paper or canvas on the wall. Does that make sense? Perfect. Like you got to install it. Yep. <laughs> you got to install it. Installation. Which is some of my favorite uh, ways to experience artwork, to be honest. It's really interesting. Okay. Are all sculptures installation pieces? No, um, because I feel, and I could be wrong. I okay. don't really know this. Right. But I feel like sculptures, it's more about the three-dimensionality of the sculpture and the piece, which can be moved from place to place easily, where the installation, you have to look at the actual space that you're in okay. and create to that. That makes total sense. Yeah. that I mean, that's totally my interpretation of it. I don't know. Like a statue is self-contained. A statue is self-contained. Yeah, I mean, like, whenever you're curating artwork in a museum or whatever, the, the curator will look at the space and, like, that matters. So I'm not saying it doesn't matter. But the sculpture is, like, uh, 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 you know, can be picked up and moved. And installation pieces can be, but sometimes they have to make adjustments depending on where it's being moved to um, because that experience of walking into a space or what that installation piece is like is part of the artwork. Cool. Okay, <clears throat> so let's do our oath. If you can raise your right hand and repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. Thank you. Okay, so our very first step is we are going to do a light wash on our flowers and our vase. Um, feel free to make any adjustments, but essentially, I just wanted to put a little bit of color there to start off with. Um, so whatever colors we're mixing, I'm gonna add water to it. That's gonna create a lighter value. And I have a hair in my palette. Okay, so I, add wa I added water to my pink to make a light pink. And then I'm just gonna paint my flower. And we can just like paint the whole thing. This morning, as I was getting ready for the day, I walked into the kitchen to, you know, start the food process, and I noticed something on my shoulder, and I looked over, and there was a little spider just hanging out <laughs> on my shoulder. It's your spider friend. Freak me out. Spidey friend. That's funny. Hey, guys. And you can see here, I'm using my round six. I'm just kind of being messy. I'm not gonna do the polka dots until this area is dry, So, but I know that I'm gonna cover it anyway, so I'm not being too particular. And then we can do a little bit of yellow in there. And if that touches and bleeds out, I'm not gonna be mad, it's okay. And then I'm gonna mix kind of an orange. So I'm gonna take some lemon yellow with some fuchsia to get kind of like an orangey gold color. Add water to it so it's a light value. And then go ahead and paint your other flower. Or your second flower, because there's three. This one kind of reminds me of the shape of a pumpkin. <laughs> totally. Just not with points, but the bottom. Do you think you've painted more flowers than anything else? Yeah, probably. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is going away. And then for this third flower, we're going to use red. And because the polka dots on that one is a very dark value, I'm okay with going a little bit darker on value on this one. That one looks like a tulip. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Okay, I'm not gonna do the green area yet because I don't want it to bleed into whatever colors I just put down, so I'm gonna move to my vase. My vase, the top is kinda like that same orangey gold color. And you can move to your round 12 if you would like. It's a little bit of a larger brush, so it's a bit easier to fill in a large space like this. Or if you wanna hold your brush more horizontally, you can get a thicker brush stroke. So this is a point brush stroke. This is holding the brush upright, and this is holding it horizontally on its side. And you can see the difference in the stroke. Width, the width of the stroke. Let's do the handles. And as you can see, my wash is not super even. Again, I'm okay with that. I'm letting that go. I'm really going to let <clears throat> the, 
the pattern of the polka dot do a lot of the work for me. So I'm not too um, worried about this part. That pot texture kind of reminds me of what terracotta looks like too. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that sun bleached terracotta look. Totally. Or like a glaze. Yeah. Like. Oh yeah, totally. Okay, and then the bottom is going to be kind of more of an orangey color. Orangey red. Red, orange. Red, crimson. <laughs> I'd like to file a formal complaint to the pot makers of the world for plants. They're so expensive. Pots are. Yes. Well. I guess it's an art form too, you know what I mean? I think it probably just depends. Like there are some that are not expensive, like at Walmart, but they're not cute. Yeah. You know, if you want the cute, if you want the custom, if you want the maker feel, you gotta pay for it. I want that Venn diagram to have a larger middle section of cheap <laughs> and cute. <laughs> Don't we all on everything? <laughs> okay. Um, so now I'm going to go to my leaves. So I'm going to mix a green. I need a bit more yellow because as you can see, well, maybe you can't see, but my yellow kind of bled into my fuchsia. So I'm going to do another yellow. And I'll move this closer so maybe you guys can see it. I've said it before, but I love how your paint palette turns out at the end of paintings. Like, I feel like it'd be cool to take a picture of every paint palette with every painting you do so that you can keep them together. You know, um, that would be cool. And we did have someone here at Let's Make Art who was doing that. He created a, an Instagram called Palettes of Watercolor, I think. <laughs> That's awesome. And he would just steal my palettes when I was done and take pictures of them and post them. Who did but that? Brock. Oh, sweet Brock. He's not here anymore. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do like a yellow green. You can do, so on my left leaf, I had a, I had a bit more yellow in there. See how it's a bit more warmer green here? And my leaf is actually kind of like pickly shaped. I was going off uh, more of her kind of designs, but again, this is your painting. You can do whatever you want. And then the right hand side, the stems and leaf, I added a bit more blue in there so it's a like a cooler green so you can see the differences in greens right there i mean i love the finished product but i think this looks so cool already yeah i i, I think there's something i think there's something here and i think that this is a good starting spot for you guys to take it other places if maybe polka dots are not your dream which is just fine if that's true, you need to rethink your life. Polka dots should be the dream, you know? Sometimes polka dots just don't speak out to people, and that's okay. <laughs> There's stripe people in the world. There are. Okay. That feels pretty good. And then what I'm going to do, I have my little paint puck here, which is our bonus item for the for the box, if you guys got our Let's Make Art History Volume 2, this really cool thing just goes on the bottom of your glass, like sticks to it, and then you can use your brush to like scrape off the excess paint. Super cool. I love it. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my heat it craft tool. Dry. How do you decide when to wash the background first and when to wash it second. Because I see a lot of blue there and I thought you would have done a big first. amount of blue first. Well, sometimes it's about the process itself. Okay. So I know if you guys have painted with, with me before, you know that I'm a huge fan of your painting is gonna inform you as you go. So for me, I wasn't planning on having a blue ba background. I was just gonna do a, a dot pattern in the back. So if you look at the step-by-step, -step, you'll see what it looked like without the blue background. Oh. And that was going to be the painting. And then I came back to it and I just thought, it's not done. It just doesn't feel done. So I'm like, well, what if I just took a paintbrush to it and put some color on the background? So I used the paint that was already there to smear. And I actually thought that that was a really cool concept and was really fun. And I like that in some of the areas it kept the patterns of the polka dots and in some of them it didn't. I thought, that that was just a really cool technique. And so I'm like, okay, this is what we're gonna paint. So um, 
But if you want, like if you look at a reference photo and you see how these dots kind of, it kind of reminds me of like tie dye a little bit or something, you know? Um, but if you want these to stay sharp in their polka dot patterns, then you would do a blue wash background first, let that dry, and then do the polka dots on top, and then everything will stay nice and sharp. If you like this kind of like blended, bleeded out look, smeared kind of look, then we're gonna do how I'm gonna teach it, which we'll do our polka dots and then smear it. Okay? Awesome. So yeah, sometimes it's just you paint something and you're like, Oh, this needs a background. Most of the time, if you can, if you know you want a background in your painting, you're gonna wanna paint your paint, uh, background first. Usually in paintings, you work your way up. So the thing farthest in the painting, you paint first, and then you paint the next layer, and the next layer, and the next layer. And that adds to the overall visualization that there are layers of planes that you're trying to communicate and paint. Like makes depth. Correct. Okay. So now we're gonna start on our polka dot, but I just want to, on a scratch paper, I just wanna show you a couple of things. Um, one, if you have one of those trays that has the holes instead of the butcher palette, actually, I have one right here. Um, I'm gonna use that because we're essentially dipping our paintbrush into, and so these, I don't usually like to work with because I don't have a lot, lot of like color mixing options or like control over how much paint I pick up. But for this, since we're using our handled paint, um, this is actually kind of nice because it stays right there and it's contained. Okay, but if you have your butcher tray palette, that'll still work, just kind of like pick it up from there. And when you do your dots, you're gonna notice that the first dot is going to be bigger and then as you keep dotting, the paint gets less so your dots get smaller. Cool. Which actually makes it really easy for you to create different patterns because you know that it's gonna start out big and work its way small. So use that knowledge to your advantage. This is my round. 12. 12, sorry for a second, I'm like, wait, what round is this? Um, so there's the 12, and then here is the two. The two and the six are actually pretty similar in size. Yeah, surprisingly. So it's actually kind of, we're gonna be doing this a lot. So um, settle down, settle in. <laughs> well, <Because, why> <laughs> settle, settle down and <laughs> settle in, because we're gonna be here for a bit. All right, so I'm gonna start with the dots on my pink flower. So I'm just gonna use straight fuchsia. And if you wanna try and do like a specific pattern, like maybe the edges of the petals have the biggest dots and then they work their way small or vice versa, um, play with it. See what you like to do. You're telling me there's no right answer. I'm telling you that you have absolute freedom and control here as the artist. And whatever decisions you make, they're not wrong. Now, I do want to say that in coming up with this, because I knew when I was thinking about artists that I wanted to talk about, I thought it would be really beneficial to mention an artist that maybe one you haven't heard of and is contemporary, is alive right now, um, and is a little bit more funky. You know what I mean? Um, and so when I saw um, Yayoi's work, I was just like, yes, this is, this is the one. And I was really taken aback by the polka dots. And I was just like, okay, it would be so cool to do this technique. And I probably tried like four or five different ways to do this. I tried painting the dots myself using the bristles. I tried just using this. Oh, uh, like touching it? And just touching it. I tried um, using little pipettes, but I found the one that was easiest was to just actually kind of stamp it. And while the dot things like pouring it straight from the bottle, which is originally what I was going to do, that was nice, but what happened is it was so much paint. 
like so much paint coming out. And even with these dots, we're getting a lot of paint. So if you're noticing that it's just like taking forever to dry because it's like a lot of paint, what I did to help it is I ripped off a little piece of paper towel, get it into a point and just barely touch it. But you have to get it into a nice point so you don't smear it. So I kind of just twist the corner and then you just touch it to the dot and it's gonna soak up any excess paint while still keeping the shape. So if you need help kind of letting that dry if it's just taking too long, that's a little tip I learned that you are free to use, my friends. That dot pattern is hypnotic to me on camera. It's nice, isn't it? And yeah. I mean, like, we're only on flower one, my friends. We're gonna be, <laughs> this, is a, this is a long one, but I don't want you to look at this like, oh, look at this entire thing that I got, like. It's about the journey. This is about creating these dots and these patterns. And to give you guys um, some background, um, Yoyoi Kusama is a Japanese artist and she was a child that grew up in Japan during World War II. She worked at factories where she had to make parachutes. She remembers the airplanes, like pretty traumatic childhood experience, I would say. Um, and because of that, she has kind of, I don't know if it's solely because of that, but she's had struggles with um, just uh, mental illness throughout her life. And she, I'm trying to mix like an orange for, um, I'm gonna mix like an orangey black. So I did all three colors essentially. There we go. Um, so she, the, the polka dot came to her in, uh, when she was very young and she hallucinated it. And actually there's this really beautiful quote um, about it, which I will read. Actually, Michael, I might have you read it since I'm dotting. Are you cool with that? Yeah. Okay, come here. It's right here in this book. So it's this it italicized here, and then it goes on to the next page there. <clears throat> One day, looking at a red flower pattern tablecloth on the table, I turned my eyes to the ceiling and saw the same red flower pattern everywhere. Even on the window glass and posts, the room, my body, the entire universe was filled with it. Myself was eliminated. I had returned and been reduced to the infinity of eternal time in the absolute of space. This was not an illusion, but reality. I was astounded. If I did not get away from there, I would be wrapped up in the spell of the red flowers and lose my life. I ran for the stairs without thinking of anything else. Looking down, I saw the steps fall away one by one, putting my leg, sorry, pulling my leg and making me trip and fall from the top of the stairs. I sprained my leg, dissolving and accumulating, proliferating and separating, a feeling of particles disintegrating and reverberations from an invisible universe. Dang. Yeah. So she all, she's had these images of these polka dots from very young. I mean, and they used to terrify her, but it was a way for her to see how everything was connected. Everything was connected and everything is nothing. Like we're all reduced down to these dots, but that, that's all everybody is, right? And what I found interesting when I read that quote is you can tell from that um, reading that that was terrifying to her. That was terrifying to her as a child, but yet it is a huge part of her work, which I find interesting. That's something um, that scared someone so bad. Um, actually, she like leaned into it creatively, um, which I think is extremely brave and interesting. And, um, I'm gonna paint, okay, so when I mix colors, I'm just gonna flip my brush around and grab some. So I'm gonna try and do like more of a black. So I'm gonna do a little bit more blue, a little bit more fuchsia, 
and let's do a little bit more yellow. Just trying to get kind of a dark value that will stick out against this red. And I have a library book here um, from just some examples of her installations and other works that she has done, which we will look through and look at probably when we're letting this dry before we smear it all with paint. She also referred to um, polka dots as infinity nets. Hmm. So if you read or look up any of her work, if um, that's how she talked about them, I also do just want to warn you guys um, that some of her installation pieces um, include naked models. So if you do not want to see nudity, just giving you a heads up. But when she was pretty young, she studied art in Japan. Um, and then when, I believe when she was about in her 20s, she decided to move to the United States to pursue an art career. She felt a little bit, um, uh, I don't know, like stifled. stifled or pressure to do traditional Japanese style of art. And she really wanted to go outside of that. And she really used Georgia O'Keeffe actually as an inspiration and reached out to her and wrote her a letter about what she wants to do and who she wants to be. And Georgia O'Keeffe was actually a huge um, uh, supporter. supporter in her dream of moving to, to New York and being an artist and helped her and all of that kind of stuff, which I think is wonderful. That's a great example of artists helping artists. Okay, so I'm going to move to like the green part of my leaves. And you can see um, I'm kind of just like going for it. If you just want to do polka dots like all over like this, you can. Or if you want to do kind of more with the patterns like I showed, feel free to. I also want to call attention to when you mix all three colors together to get the really dark black value, um, you will, you might get some like bleeding. You see here how it's like smeared a little bit and bleeding. Mm -hmm. That's just because there's so much paint and not enough water in that, that it kind of like, so um, if it's really bothering you, try adding a little bit of water to it to see if that helps. I didn't really mind it though. It didn't really bother me. Sarah, how cool would it be to do this large and to use your fingers for the dots? That would be cool. Or maybe just have tiny, tiny fingers. <laughs> you get your baby. <laughs> <laughs> I love babies. Yeah, babies are pretty oh great. Gosh. Brand new babies. They're the greatest thing. Just holding them. Just so squishy. Okay. So when I get to the vase part, I'm actually gonna switch to my 12. And the other thing that I like about my 12 is not only do I get a larger mark, but what the other thing that you can do to make these dots is you could actually move the move it around itself. So then you're making it bigger by kind of smearing it. You know what I'm saying? Totally. So I'm just going to keep doing that. And um, I'm going to show you the cover of this book from the library to give you an idea of how she uses dots. Whoa. It's kind of glary. Better? Totally. Dang. Okay. So she does, she definitely uses like that pattern of big to small. Her um, dots get tiny. Yeah. You know what I mean? So after I put in my big dots and I'm just going to do my big to little. Did she talk about how she makes hers? Well, there's so many different um, ways that she uses them. It's not oh. just on paper. Like, um, I don't, I don't specifically remember how. I do know that it takes a very long time. <laughs> and, um, but that's part of it. And it's interesting too, like, when she has talked about um, what one of her, uh, 
I don't know if it's her collectors or producer, I don't know, somebody who knows her work very well, um, said that um, her work is meant to immerse the whole person into her obsessions and repetitions. These infinite works were originally meant to eliminate intrusive thoughts um, that she now shares with the world. So this is just her kind of introducing to this like repetitive motion that continues forever. Um, but she did also say that her work doesn't explain her mental illnesses, but actually um, is the, the like pushing factor behind it. Her her wanting to create and create and create, and the way her mind kind of upset, uh, um, obsesses, um, that is what has pushed her into who she is as an artist because she makes an insane amount of work, like at an insane pace. Um, maybe insane is not the right word, I'm sorry for using that word, um, at an extreme pace. So it's, it's just kind of interesting how her experiences of her own mind and um, how they contribute to her work and who she is as an artist. And we have seen that um, in other famous artists, Van Gogh, you know. Okay, and then when I get to the handles, I'm just going to kind of polka dot it out. It is fun having, you know, being married to you, I've been subject to way more art than I think I would have in a different life. Mm -hmm. But being subject to art, I've come to realize that there are paintings that you appreciate the product. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful painting. And there are paintings that you appreciate the process and you go like wow yeah that was that's an incredible level of work i'm going to switch my round two and do these thin lines just at the top yes and actually i read this really interesting article about how to view like look at art because um i think sometimes art I think sometimes we don't know how to interact with it because sometimes we're like, well, this takes itself too seriously and it's literally splatters on a canvas. I can make that. Sometimes we can look at a painting. You can look at a bunch of dots and just be like, I don't understand this. Right. And when you don't understand something, it's really difficult to appreciate it. And that's, that's just how it is. So um, this article was just like, if you are confronted with a painting that you don't understand, the the there's a few things that you can do one you can do a little bit of research about who the artist is where they came from two you can look at um, maybe trying to understand what they were trying to communicate so sometimes the artists are very open of this is about this um, and sometimes they're not so like you can try and see if you can find out like what it is they're trying to say but sometimes artists don't do that. And so you have to then say, what is my relationship to this piece? And art is so much more than just being something beautiful. Um, art is meant to make you feel something. And sometimes it's meant to make you feel disoriented. Sometimes it's meant to make you feel calm. Sometimes it's meant as um, a way to process emotions or experiences from the artist's perspective. And they're like, great, if you wanna look at it, that's cool, but I'm gonna keep making art no matter what. Um, sometimes it's meant to call attention to some issues that maybe you weren't aware of, or sometimes it's meant just to be pretty. And all of these are valid. All of the, I really don't believe that one is better than the other. And so um, when we experience things like installation art, um, where we're just like, I don't understand why there are polka dots everywhere, that seems really weird, um, take a step back and say, okay, well, what is this person trying to say? And um, where did they come from? And how does this actually make me feel? Because that, that one question, I think is extremely powerful and one that we don't utilize a lot. I think sometimes we hope that people will tell us how something makes us feel, so then we won't be wrong. But that how we, our relationship to a piece of art is personal 
and it is relative and it's going to be different for everybody. So when we sit and we look at something and say, how does this make me feel? We're being completely honest with ourselves and giving ourselves permission to have an opinion that may be different from someone else's which is sometimes scary because we're like, well, I don't know anything about art and maybe how this makes me feel is not what it makes this person who knows more about art feel and so therefore I'm wrong. I don't think that's how it works. Well, in, in a personal scenario, that's exactly how, like it is for me going to museums with you who, I mean, you have, you have a literal degree in art. You know what to look for. You've studied art history. You it intimidates me because mm -hmm. I feel like I should go in, see a painting, and it should just click. And mm -hmm. like, oh, I get this. This is mm -hmm. the, the blah, blah, blah movement originated mm -hmm. in this area. But like, <laughs> it is never like that for me. Yeah. Um, a good example is when we went to New York recently, and I think her name's Kathy Kalowitz. I, don't, I could be butchering The prints? Right. There was these, these prints, and I walked into the room. And on their own, they're beautiful, and they, they elicit an emotion when you see them. But, like, because I don't know what to look for, how to relate to these things, reading the little subtext, I mean, it made me ball like a baby. Yeah, they were beautiful. Those were probably my favorite things that I saw at that museum. And we saw Starry Night there. <laughs> um, but... It was really um, moving. Moving. Um, Michael, do you actually mind looking up that artist so we can make yeah. sure we're saying her name correctly so you can um, see for yourself if you're interested? Um, but yes, yeah, sometimes I think we shy away from going to museums because we're like, well, I don't understand it. Those little informational cards that are next to paintings, especially if it's like you're walking into a room and it's like a larger paragraph about like, what this whole thing is about are extremely helpful and they are there for you. They're there to give you context because the expectation is not for you to know everything. That's too much. That is not that expectation. And sometimes I'm afraid my class that expectation will be in a museum. He's like, well, what is this about? And I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> she just makes it up and I believe her. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think she's German, so I could be mispronouncing her name, but it's Kathy. K-A-T-H-E, Kallwitz, K-O-L-L-W-I-T-Z. Yeah. Those were so powerful. I get choked up thinking about them years later. I, I did cry. I did when I, when I saw them. Cause when they're, you about, like, they're about war and loss. She yeah. was around you know, in Germany during the periods of war and lost uh, her sons. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's what the art is about. Um. Because when you, when, you, when you see it, and now I'm, just so you guys know, I'm moving on to doing the dots in my background and feel free to make any patterns that you want to or not make any patterns. Feel free to use um, something like this as inspiration if you're not sure what patterns to make or kind of just go for it. Um, yeah, so when you see the paintings themselves, or they're not paintings, they're, um, I think they're prints, like printmaking. Is a lithograph a word? Uh huh. That's what it says on the Google. Yeah. And um, you're like, wow. And then you read the title of them, and then you look at the imagery again, and you're like, holy cow. That's exactly what that feels like. Anyways, all of that is the long way to say that uh, I'm still intimidated at museums, and I've been to more art, you know, galleries and things and I feel like a lot of people have I don't think it's something that you get better at I think it's something that you get more comfortable trusting yourself at mm -hmm. or you get more comfortable being uncomfortable that makes sense yeah <laughs> you know yeah Okay, and then when I get to, so I kind of liked these spirally patterns. I don't, I, I didn't pull those specifically from her work. Her, I feel like her patterns are a little bit more linear, um, but I thought that they were kind of cool. So I did kind of more spirally patterns here, but then when I did, like, I wanted to kind of mimic a tabletop without creating a table. So that's where I really went for, like, the more um, thick to thin pattern here my hope being that it kind of created almost an edge for this vase to sit on. And I'm using my round 12 to make these dots. 
but use whatever brush or if you found another method that's easier for you, better for you, um, do that instead. This is your painting. The other thing I think that's interesting about gallery art is I, again, I'm not, I don't live in everyone's head, so I don't know for real, but I imagine that almost everyone in that gallery's dream was not to like be a gallery artist. They're just creating mm -hmm. and it happens to be, you know what I mean? Yeah. And what, um, absolutely. And like the, I mean, and I don't know every artist and I don't know every intention, but I think for the most part, people create because they like to create. And then if that means um, eventually that they work towards having art shows and being in museums, that's awesome. Um, but maybe it doesn't, but they still make. It just kind of goes contrary to like that little kid dream of like, I want to be famous and a movie star, like, and that's the goal, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the path for painting isn't really like that. It's kind of like finding yourself and your your voice, and then that resonates outwards. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm very chatty. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I like it. Um, gosh, I feel like I was going to say something, but I can't remember. Well, now I'm kind of in this um, zone. It's working. It's working. I'm feeling like I don't need to speak. Like maybe we could just sit here and make these marks and kind of just let our mind wander. Get around the flowers too. I think what I also love about artists is, um, well, just art in general, but sometimes there are, you know, when we were talking about, sometimes people will look at art and say, well, I can make that, or what is that? That's just splatters. And like, some artists poke fun at the whole idea of fine art. What makes something, what makes something fine art and something not fine art, and they like, push like I'm sure you've seen like the toilet in the museum I think that's Deshaun, but I could be wrong and it's really just poking fun of the idea of being like is this fine art now because it's in a museum is this what I mean I could be getting my references mixed up that's entirely possible but um, there are these experiences of artists saying what is art and who defines art and why is it that this all of a sudden is high end and high brow and you're willing to pay a lot of money for it when literally every person has this in their household or it flushes poop, you know, like. Well, we were watching a show last night and a guy was in a museum and saw the fire extinguisher. Yeah. It's like, how much? Because like to him, it seemed like an, an art piece. And that's yeah. what's funny to me is like, you know, anybody can appreciate something because of their experience, Yeah. you know. But it's just kind of poking fun of, yeah. of the whole idea in general and, and why some things um, count and why some things don't and how to break down those walls or how, and some people are very passionate about it, of being like, no, this, this is real art and this, this is hotel art. Like, you know, I remember hearing that in, in some of my college and I just find it all interesting i find it interesting that we constantly choose to place one thing above the other because it's 
it doesn't have to be like that, you know? And I, I think that there's value to all of it. I think that that concept, the hotel art concept, is not constrained to just art, you know, drawing, painting. You know, that's, people call the same thing in music, they call it pop music and they turn their nose up to it. Mm -hmm. Or like, in everything, there's always the like, oh, that's the student version, or that's mm -hmm. the... I think people just like to make themselves feel good. I don't know. Well, I think it's natural. I think sometimes that we create these invisible rules and hierarchies and structures because then it makes us feel more important. Right. It, or yeah. it helps us know our space within this. It's yeah. like a comfort thing for our ego. Almost. Elevating yourself at the expense of someone, though it's mean to do, I feel like it's almost human nature. Like, well, I make real art, not hotel right. art. But really, when you see that happening, you recognize that what that is, is that's more about, that has nothing to do with you. Like, let's say you painted something, and someone's like, well, that's not real art because you traced that, or you followed a tutorial, so that's not real art. That comment, in actuality, has absolutely nothing to do with you and what you are doing. That has everything to do with that person and how they feel about themselves, which is fascinating. You can't <laughs> see me, but I'm nodding my head so big over here. Um, and I think that sometimes stops us from doing things of of because we're afraid, or maybe somebody did say something like that to us, which just took the wind out of our sails. Because creating something, no matter in what way or what form, is scary, is courageous, is vulnerable. And then to get like just <sighs> from someone who would say something like that, especially if it's a friend, you're like, well, wait a second. And sometimes it hurts so bad that it stops us from continuing to do it. But, and this is not an easy thing to do, but you have to recognize that it had that comment, those ideas, um, the, the, the pull back of like, no, you can't do this, you know, that has nothing to do with you and you're not doing anything wrong. And it just seems like a person who says that just has work that they need to do with on themselves um, because usually you're harder on yourself. You know what I mean? So if she's, if that person's that hard on you, imagine how they talk to themselves. Like, yeah. not a happy place. Um, so don't let things like that, don't let the naysayers, don't let the people who just have some personal work to do stop you from being the best version of yourself or stop you from pursuing a passion or an interest or stop you from exploring something or putting yourself out there and being vulnerable. Okay, I did my dots everywhere. We're gonna so let this dry. <laughs> well, I could always do more dots. I like the idea, you know, someone who's very critical of the simple splatter painting saying, I could do that. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere once where someone was snarkily said, then do it, right? <laughs> yeah. But like, that's kind of lived in my head for so long that it's transformed. And I want to say to them, do it, but not in a snarky way, because I feel like if they were to undertake that creative process, it would change their mind. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, I mean, I'm thinking of so many quotes, right, where one of them, one of my favorites is, and I'm not going to say it right, I'm summarizing, but Elizabeth Gilmore, uh, Elizabeth um, Gilbert, who is a writer, and um, she said, you know, when people don't like your art, then just smile sweetly and say, well, go make Go make your own art. She says the F word in there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then also another idea from um, Brene Brown comes to mind of it's, it's not the critic who counts. It's the person who's in the arena with you, who has been, who has experienced what you're experiencing. Like that's feedback you listen to. But this person over here who is not in your shoes and is not getting dirt kicked up on them and is not putting themselves out there, they don't get to have a say. And, um, gosh, there was one more that I wanted to say, but now I can't remember, but. I always, when I create something, I always am thinking of the invisible audience member, which I know is not the way to do it. Yeah. But that dictates my life, and a lot of times it keeps me from making anything. Yep. I think, you know, there's no finish line of, quote, unquote, being successful. But I think a big step is when you realize that, like, you make this for you, and people mm -hmm. can see it if they want. 
Yeah. They can see it if they want. They can like it or not. They can want it or not. All of that is external and independent from the fact that I am going to create something. Um, okay, we need to let this dry. I took my heat gun to it, but as you can see, it's, it's still fairly wet in the larger area. So I'm just gonna give it a moment to like not put the heat gun on it, to let it air dry for a minute. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of um, Yayao's, Yayoi's work. And, oh, I remember the thing when you said like, you know, people say I can't do that. So one of my favorite stories about my dad is I was an art major and um, he, my parents always, they supported me in it, but it was kind of more like, are you gonna be an art teacher? What are you gonna do with this? You know, and that was my plan. I was gonna be, uh, well, I am an art teacher now, but anyways. <laughs> And um, he was just like, yeah, I remember when I was newly married and I saw these pieces of art and they were just kind of splatters of paint. And I thought, I could do that. And, you know, I'm not going to pay a lot of money for that. He was like, so I bought canvas and I bought paint and I set it all up. He was like, and then I didn't do anything. I didn't make anything. He was like, and then I realized that it's about, it's a, I can't do it. <laughs> Like they were able to do it. And not only were they able to do it, they actually did it. And then they actually put it up for sale. He was like, but when I, when I stood in front of this canvas and I had this paint and I like thought I knew what I wanted to do, I froze. And I actually didn't know how to do it. And it seemed so simple just looking at it. But when I tried to do that myself, I couldn't figure out how. And he was like, and then I understood the value. Just like that, I understood the value. And I was just like, dad. <laughs> That's a great. <laughs> Gave him one big hug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna let this air dry and I'm gonna work really hard not to rest the book on the painting. Okay, so this is some of um, Yoyoi's earlier work. This is actually on um, canvas. And maybe I'll do the detail shot here. Can you do the close up cam maybe? So this work is actually huge. She would do these huge, I'm wondering if there is a size here. Like this is her Holy cow. in comparison to it. So this was extremely detailed, extremely time consuming, repetitive motions. Like think of the, the sheer man hours that went, Whoa, man. woman hours that went into creating something like this. So this is some of her earlier work when she first moved out to New York and this is what she was working on. Um, and then here is, I just thought this was funny. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. Um, so here are some, so she uses dots a lot, polka dots, obviously. Um, pumpkins are also a common theme within her work. This is in Japan. Um, and then here is, she would create these things called infinity rooms. And this is part of her installation. So she would essentially line a room with mirrors and then use dots or lights or um, forms itself when the, within there to create this feeling of forever, eternity of this. I mean, it's kind of haunting. You showed me this before I read that quote. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, those are cool. But after reading that, I'm like, dang. It's terrifying. Scary. Yeah. It's like terrifying and beautiful at yeah. the same time. Um, and then there is, here's another example of her infinity rooms. Whoa. So this is lights and glass um, and mirrors. I'm going to be kind of careful as I flip through this because I don't want you to accidentally see naked people, but yeah, it's just... Um, I have a very silly question and you might not know the answer, sorry. but is there a difference between just dots and polka dots? Does something qualify it? As a polka dot? Do you know? I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. And um, so if you look at just all of the different work that she has done, here's some more. Whoa. Like there are, it like touches on um, the conceptual minimalism, surrealism, feminism, pop art, abstract expressionism, like she has such a great body of work and um, it's just, it's just interesting. In the 70s, she moved back to Japan and um, kind of she checked herself into a 
uh, mental health facility. And that's where she still is, actually. She chooses to live there, and her studio is not far from the facility. So she still makes art, and she does what she can to take care of her mental health, wow. um, which is great. So That's some self-realization. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, wow. I think, well, I think she's had a hard time. Okay, I think what we might actually do is kind of stop the cameras and edit back to when this is dry so we can do that last step. Um, so I'll see you guys back when this is dry. Bye. Bye. And we're back. We are going to finish our very last step for our Dot Flowers project, and that is we're going to uh, smear things around. Okay? You're going to ruin all your hard work. All the hard work we just did. It's not ruined. It's not, it's just different. Okay, so, and this is where like, it's completely up to you, right? We did, we talked about um, this artist, we talked about her use of dots, we talked about what they meant to her, what she was trying to communicate. Um, and that is why we use dots so heavy in this image. Now, you as the artist who created this can look at this and say, I actually really like what I created, I don't want to smear it. Or maybe you can say, I'm only gonna do it over here. like. Let your curiosity guide you on, think about it like, I wonder what happens if I do this. And just kind of follow that thought wherever it will take you. And sometimes it will work out great and sometimes maybe not, but it's not a big deal because it does not define your value as an artist. So I got to this point when creating this project and I was just like, okay, it still feels a little empty though. It, it just didn't have that same punch that I wanted it to have. So I just took my round 12 and I took some water and I just smeared. So you just take a damp brush and you'll notice I'm not working back and forth. I am doing deliberate single brush strokes because if you work it back and forth, then you'll lose the dots easier. And I wanna keep some of those dots there but I just think this is so cool. Like as soon as I swooped it, I was like, oh yes. <laughs> and I have to admit that like, I was terrified to actually swoop it because um, I could have ruined it, right? Like it was a fine project, just how it was. And I could have knocked it off my list. So I knew by taking water that I'm like, okay, this is me saying that I might have to redo this and this might not work out. And then you just go for it anyway. I think it worked out though. I, I love, love this yeah. look. It's fun watching it on camera. It reminds me of those like safety pens for children where they only color on specific paper. Yes. So it's a clear pen and you make a swoop and it turns out blue. Yes. It's fun watching your brush with no paint on it swipe and turn blue. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I feel like this, by smearing it, even though we lose some of our dots, which which is a huge part of what we're trying to do, I feel like it added more to that. Like, I think back to the um, to the rooms and those installation pieces of it just going on forever. And I feel like that captures this a little bit more of just like this whole world that goes on forever of dots. Now, the longer you let your dots dry, um, the more your dots will stay when you smear them out, which is why I try to let it um, dry as long as possible. Oh, look, it hit some of my pink, but look how pretty that is. Yeah, that's awesome. Ooh, I love that. That was not intentional, but I am not mad about it. Like, imagine doing... I don't know, I'm thinking... Excuse me, I'm thinking of like a landscape. A landscape in dots and then just letting it dry and then just smearing with water. 
you could probably get some really cool stuff. And I'm just going to carefully work around these areas. If you get a bit smeary, it's not the end of the world. And then I smeared this pink flower and some of the greens a little bit. Um, but I'm going to leave that choice up to you. And I'm going to use my round six for that, for this pink flower. And I want you to play with how much water is on your brush. For example, what happens if there is a ton of water on your brush? What happens if you actually kind of dab it on the paper towel and do kind of more of a brush or like a dry brush stroke smear? What does that do? And just kind of like experiment because all of this experimentation will give you information on um, things that you can take and maybe utilize in other work. So don't shy away from it. Go for it. That fuchsia color on blue is so good. Yeah. And I'm going to do just some like dots around the center here. Just felt like it needed something. Gosh, isn't that fun? Yeah. It's really, it's really beautiful. I love how it turned out. And maybe I'll do one. What if I do like one right in the middle to kind of smear it like a like the vein of the leaf, you know? You know? You know what? Love it. Just cleaning up around the edges. Ah! So satisfying. Watercolor, man. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. Look at this. Ah, I love it so much. Okay. Um, that is our project. I hope that you had fun. I hope you learned a new technique about making the dots. I hope you appreciated talking about a contemporary artist and the various ways that you can communicate ideas and um, really just learning about artists and art movements and art styles in general can not only increase your understanding and education that you can apply to your own skill set and craft, but it's just kind of enriching and it makes you have this appreciation for this kind of human experience that we all have of being here and um, different ways of communicating ideas, um, which is so wonderful. I think it's a really wonderful thing. And um, so if you paint this, I really wanna see it. Um, I think everybody's is gonna turn out a bit different and I think that you guys will are incredibly creative and find ways to adjust things and make decisions and I wanna see what those turn out like. So if you're on Instagram, you can tag us at Let's Go Make Art or hashtag Let's Make Art or hashtag Let's Make Art Watercolor. Um, if you're on Facebook, you can join our online community. It's very large and there is a large, um, skill set in there, you know, from very, very beginner to people who've been painting for years and years. That can be intimidating, but know that it's an accepting community where we celebrate and appreciate every um, part of the process. Just like this painting, it's about the journey. Exactly. It's just about the journey and learning from each other. Um, that's called Let's Make Art Watercolor. And if you need any of these supplies, you can find them at letsmakeart.com. And um, Michael, I really appreciated our conversation today. It was really fun. Anytime. Thank, thank you for being here. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.